Welcome to Healthy University, where we'll discuss issues and subjects on how you can live a healthier and more productive life. And now, here's your host for Healthy University, Alan Eisenberg. Hello and welcome to Healthy University. This is your host, Alan Eisenberg, and I am thrilled today to have um, not only Bob and Christine from Stress Free Now with me we, with me today, uh, the Wrights, who we've had a couple times now, and it's great, but I also have my son Andy, which is uh, a really a thing of pride for me today, and I, we're going to talk about some interesting subjects. Uh, about around bullying, stress, uh, things that are happening in the in the world today. I think uh, I think we're all under a lot of stress and anxiety. So uh, let's get started. And I'll tell you, you know, I, I just have to say something up front um, with my son here. Uh, he wonders what his crazy dad does all the time with all this uh, bullying recovery and stress and certified coaching thing. And truly, you know, several years ago, um, I needed someone to support me. I had two things happen. Uh, I thought I was dying of stomach cancer and had to go through a lot of tests and couldn't drive. And my son took care of me then. And then I broke my foot and he took care of me then. And then I think, I don't know if it's because of those things and because of the nature of who he is. But now he last year, he went and became an emergency medical technician and works in the hospital, helping many other people, which is, I think, an honorable profession. I'm very proud of him but also a stress profession. And I think that's a good uh, thing to, to, to have him here to talk. Uh, so thanks for coming, Andy. Thanks for joining us. Um, no, I'm happy to be here. Great. Uh, Alan, I just want to chime in. Hi, this is Dr. Bob. Um, this is the first time that we're meeting your son, and I think this is so wonderful, wonderful to have a father-son um, or interview so this is amazing and thank you andy for uh agreeing to join us yeah no problem i agree it's a very special moment it, it really is it's just there's there's so many things going on today and y you know i think we forget like when when we go when we have emergencies you know when we're at our worst you know he and the people that work in the hospitals have to be at their best and I saw an amazing story the other day of a woman who, you know, her, her baby was 14 weeks old and the father was hit. They were in a car accident, the father and the baby. And the baby survived with several damage, but the father didn't. And 10 years later, she invited all the people from the rescue squad and the hospital to the 10th birthday party. And she went around and did this. And, you know, most of them said, nobody's ever done that. Nobody's ever thanked us. And I thought, you know, that's an important thing to say thank you, even even to people that don't always hear it. And, you know, just as we, we talk about forgiveness and, and asking for forgiveness, even if the person doesn't hear uh, us say it, we should ask for it um, or we should ask that or we should forgive them, I guess is what I'm really saying. And in the same way that we should thank the people if we can uh, whether they're there or not, who have helped us along our own journeys. And like I said at the beginning, you know, I, I don't think I'd be in the spot I'm in today if it wasn't for this guy sitting next to me. I think what you're doing is very important, Alan, and what you said is very true. Part of lessening our stress and living a fulfilled life is the ability to express gratitude, to notice what's right in our lives, and especially um, what this mother did in the case of, of loss, that she was still able to celebrate gratitude and to thank the people who helped and saved her child's life. So it's very important, those two things that you mentioned in terms of lowering our stress is to be able to express gratitude and to be able to forgive. Those are two very, very important qualities um, that we can live our lives with. And Alan, I just want to segue in on that because uh, you mentioned gratitude. Christine has cued me in many times on people who uh, have often been overlooked where, for example, if you go to a restaurant, you may remember to always tip the waiter or waitress, but do you tip the bus boy 
play or bus girl that actually is working even harder. So that's one of the things. And then I know uh, when we stayed in a hotel, I don't. I always tip the um, the the the, uh, the bell um, hop people. Um, you know, if if the car is at the valet, um, I don't think anything, or even sometimes someone at the front desk. But it was only when Christine alerted to me to we were checking out of a hotel once, and she said, "Well, I have to make sure that the housekeeping staff that I leave a really good tip for them." And I said, "Oh, wow, I." I never thought of leaving a tip for the, the housekeeper. She says, well, they work the hardest in the hotel. They they make your bed, they clean the toilet, make sure the tub's clean, they vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. And I, when I thought about it, I said, oh, wow. And so I wanted to make this point, Alan, where you are talked about saying thank you. And I wanted to say, especially to someone who may not normally uh, get it. So we were staying in a hotel in, in Connecticut, and I said to Christine, instead of leaving the tip on the um, on the on the dresser next to the TV, I want to put it in the hand of the housekeeper. And so I went out the front door, looked down the hall, and then I saw the car, and I went up to her and I said, "Hi, thank you so much for the wonderful service that we've received. This is for you." And I put it in her hand. Yeah. And Alan and Andy, I have to tell you, it was one of the most amazing experiences. Something happened totally unexpected. Well, the tears welled up in her eyes. And at that moment of human connection, what I realized was, oh, this money that I'm actually giving her right at this moment, she really needed it. It wasn't just like a tip. She may have needed it to get home by taxi or something. You could really tell when a person needs the money that you're giving them. And so I, I felt buoyed by that, that, you know, I was there at the time to do that. And so I just want to mention that that aspect of gratitude where the benefit is, is not only to the person receiving it, but to the giver. And it, 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 it just can spread if we if we remember like dominoes that 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 spread joy and gladness wherever we go. Well, and, and you, you're, you're hitting on a point I talk about a lot, which is when you volunteer to help others less fortunate than you or when you give money, which really for you is not a big deal if you're doing okay, it really means something to someone else. And we, you know, it's just that little thing, you know, whether you voluntarily help people like people build houses, of course, or, or in my world, you know, I always I always like to do it around the holidays, but you know, I go to the same barber shop and they're just the nicest people. Like one time he was white, he was, you know, it's a Asian barber shop and he's using this cool brush to, to get all the hair off the bottom, the floor. And I'm like, that is an awesome brush. And he goes, you want one? I said, yeah. He goes, next time I'm at the store, I'll pick you up one, $5. Sure enough, the next time I went in, he, there was the brush. You know, it was like five dollars. He could have charged me ten bu- bucks. You know, I, I would have bought it. And and then so this year I said, you know, he's the one. They're the ones I'm giving it to. And it just so happened that um, the one person who cut my hair was like the youngest person who had just gotten married. And you know, it's sixteen dollars for a guy's haircut. Sorry, Christine, but that's the truth. And I gave her fifty dollars. And, I, and I, I turned around and walked away. And I could just, as I walked away, I could see the shock on her face. Like, you know, thought she was going to be handing me more money. But, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's a greater joy for me and for those of us that truly have a giving and caring spirit. It, giving is much more rewarding than getting. And, and that's just my feeling. But but I did want to bring up you know for Andy you know you, he's been at the job now a couple of weeks you know what do you feel like when you do I know you've had some very exciting days and we've talked about you know the hardship of working in a hospital an emergency room is you're going to see people that you're going to save and you're going to see people that you're not going to save and you have to be able to let go of the one things you can't control the ones you couldn't save. So for for you, Andy, what how do you handle that, or, or what do you see? Have you gotten any, you know, attaboys or feel any great satisfaction when you're in end end a day at work? Um, yes, I've I've had a lot of attaboys, and I've had a lot of people tell me I'm 
on a good path and doing the right thing. Uh, but a lot of it is, I, I don't feel stress at work. Um, it's on the outside looking in, mm -hmm. it's a very stressful pr profession and it's a very stressful place to be. And everyone who's there, most of them don't want to be there. Um, but we who are working there, we, we want to be here. That's where we are at our best. It's like you said earlier, um, at your best. So we have to be at our best. Right. And that's we're, we're the kind of people who are comfortable in those situations. Our, our adrenaline is pumping. We're excited. We're, we're there, you know, to save lives, to help people the best we can. So we are at our best. Um, but like on the outside, you're seeing stress, stress, stress. But I'm not taking the time to think about stuff like that. But do you, while do you, I'm, yeah, do you deal with the patient? Like as they're stressed, Andy has a natural ability to make people feel good. That's just, you know, this innate ability. What do you, what do you do with them? How do you calm them? I mean, someone in an emergency situation, there, there really isn't a lot of calming them, mm -hmm. Un unless you're. I'm, I'm not going to be there to tell, talk to them because I'm just an emergency medical technician. So it, it's mostly up to a nurse or a doctor to get there, calm them down, let them know what's going on, and try and calm them down the best they can. But in the end, most times it goes to medication being what's going to calm them down the best. Uh, however, on the family side, right. keeping a mother calm while her baby's getting an IV, keeping you know a son and a, a father calm while they're while the son's mother is, you know, on the table being worked CPR on, uh, that's a different story. Yeah. Keeping them calm is is kind of something I can do. I can pull them to the side, tell them they're okay, or, you know, you talk to them. We're doing all we can, get them chairs to sit in, anything they might need, anything like that. But as far as the patients, um, it, what, what they come in with is, is, is going to depend on, you know, how they're going to be. Yeah. I know, I know we went off on a tangent here, but... You know, I, I think, you know, with you being stress-free now, it's, it's such a good subject, and it's such an important thing. Well, I don't thing. consider it a tangent at all, Alan, and I'm, I'm curious. Um, what I notice, and Andy, because I'm just meeting you for the first time, what I'm noticing is that you obviously have a natural aptitude for this, and please tell me if I'm correct because I'm making, you know, leaps here, but it would seem to me that there's an aspect of your work that energizes you because you sound as if you have not only great skill for what you're doing, but you have a great passion for it. So you can tell me if, those, if that's correct. And I'm curious, what do you do for self-care? I mean, does your energy stay high all the time or... When you're off duty, do you do something else that relaxes you or revitalizes you for your next shift? Uh, Christine, you're completely correct. I've I've tried the nine to five desk job for the last two years before moving into this profession, and it it drained me. It I, I'd come home from work every day tired, even though my job was to sit in a chair and look at a computer all day. I um, it, it really brought me to a low place in my life, and I really couldn't stand it. So um, I, I've always had... Uh, Andy, could, could you say that again? That, that uh, staring at a screen all day <laughs> put you to a low place? <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh, but I think so many people would identify with that, that you're outside, you're up moving around, that that's a natural thing to want to move around. The body wants to move. Right, and right. That's, and that's what we were built to do, and we've managed to end up the opposite. And we wonder why we're overweight, we wonder why we're, you know, not happy, we wonder why all these things. Because we were built to be out in the fields all day, or hunting, you know, hunting, gathering. <laughs> you know, we're... we're Come we're on, Alex flowers yeah <laughs> but but it's it it is sad now, I, want, I, I, I want to segue off of this what we're talking about and and uh, direct our listeners to um something that christine and i have talked about which ties into what what andy was talking about but in a different way andy was talking about how he used the uh, words 
to calm the people that have been injured or the family members or friends of people of someone who's been injured in an emergency situation. Christine wrote an article, and to me, was one of the most amazing things I've ever read. Well, yeah, she is my wife and partner, but um, I think... Once I looked at the content and I looked at how well constructed it was, I, I had to give her props. So what I'm talking about specifically, she wrote an article um, called Sticks and Stones. And, you know, as most people will be familiar with the old nursery rhymes, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never harm me. Well, that is actually not true. In fact, words uh, can often hurt more than you know, someone hitting you because someone hits you, you know, assuming that you survive, you may forget that at some point. But um, often when someone says something that um, at a particular time, and timing is always key here, but they could say something so hurtful that it might stay with a person for the rest of their lives. So... So, Christine, I, what I want you to just talk about briefly is how words that adults use, sometimes in the family context, sometimes outside of the family, that they use with young children and teens, that they often aren't aware how the impact that these words can have. And I want you to focus on the solutions, you know, of, of, of that would be helpful to um, both the child and the parent. Where do I begin, Bob? I think everybody in our listening audience and the four of us here can think of a time when somebody said something that was hurtful and it it may have been intentional and it may have been, as the person said, in jest. But if your feelings were hurt, if you felt sad or weakened by a callous remark or a careless remark, damage was done. And it's, it's especially hard for little children because little children most times are not going to correct an adult. They're not going to correct another child, too, if, if they're in a feeling state. When some, most of us and young children, when our feelings are hurt, we shut down and we don't have words to speak back. There may be a, a bold or mature child who said, that was mean, that hurt. But when someone says, you know, go away or disappear, I wish you weren't there, I'm going to leave you behind, a child can't process that. They don't know. And they believe it. They believe when a parent says, oh, I'm just going to leave you here. You're no good. You're just like this. You're just like that. And that hurts. And even adults, you know, uh, spouses, a boss, an employee, yeah. you're the dumbest person that ever worked here. You can never do anything right. And if you're in a weakened state, you might internalize that and the damage is done, you're playing it over in your head, you're frustrated, you're angry, and you don't say anything back. So mm -hmm. um, oh. you really, it, 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 it's a matter of us learning and owning our words. And if you're on the receiving end of an unkind remark, take a breath if you need to. and. Respond in the moment. If you're not able to respond in the moment, even if it's a little while later, a few minutes, a few hours, a few days, no. speak I... to that person. And if they're, if they're like that, I mean, this is what you do, Alan, when you, no. when you talk about being, it's, it's mean, it was meant to hurt. And you need to respond to that and find a way to stop that behavior if you're not able to do it yourself. Get an ally, get an advocate, get an intermediary, but it's not acceptable. Yeah, and, and get help. I mean, get help. You know, don't, don't sit still, get help. And that's, that's you know, of course, hard when we're talking about children, but, you know, it, it just happened last night. I, I heard a story where uh, and a stewardess on a plane saw a guy with a young girl, and she was all bruised. And she said something to the girl to come to the bathroom, and she gave her a note, and she said, you know, if you need help, tell me and you know it was human trafficking and she caught on to it which i thought was interesting just same thing you know i keep talking about you know this this idea of taking emotional attendance and noticing when someone is hurting but 
I've also had some really interesting guests in between our conversations. Like a couple of weeks ago, I had this guy, Nathan, who was a victim of familial bullying by his mother and his brother. That was so bad because, again, you know, you're in a situation you can't get out of. You're in the family. Uh, he, he was homeless for, for many years. He had no self-esteem. And, you know, he finally gave up his family, which you can imagine is a very difficult so there's workplace bullying, and, and that's a problem because people have to have a paycheck. And there's, you know, hu- husband and wife, you know, abuse and bullying. And, and so I, as, as I've learned, you know, this this schoolyard bullying and this particularly the word bullying, um, the cyber bullying is really becoming harmful because you're right, Christine, there, you can't take back what was done. And, you know, you're right, Bob, you know, when, when boys fight, when you take a punch, you knew you were bullied. But when someone is abusing you on the Internet uh, behind your back uh, without identity, that's a whole other matter. And the harm is, I think, much greater. Yeah, you know, Alan, that you, you, there, there, you know, I, I want you to speak to uh, the 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 results that you've seen and the effects that you've seen when you've delivered your anti-bullying message in the public schools, you know, I'd like the audience to hear, you know, how in your experience the, 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 the victims and the bullies have responded to it and whether or not um, the administrators or teachers have implemented any of your recommendations. But before you speak to that, Alan, when you were just talking, you know, about that horrible case of bullying in the family, it just made me think of a case where uh, I believe the girl was 12 years old who committed suicide. She was on a school team, I don't remember what team, maybe volleyball or soccer, and she was had gone to the bathroom and as a prank, that which they thought, you know, talk about pranks that gone wrong, but it's actually intimidation, they busted down, her teammates busted down the, um, busted down the door while she was going to the bathroom and snapped her picture and then put it up on social media, I guess Instagram, Facebook, etc. And so when she went to school, you know, you can imagine she was totally humiliated. She couldn't walk down the hall, etc. And she, she killed herself. Yeah. So um, this this is so so we're seeing stories where girls have killed themselves, where boys have killed themselves, and we're not even talking about the adults where you know the suicide rate. In fact, I was in um, a, 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 a workshop recently, and a gentleman said to me that to, I, I had never heard this before, so I have to check it out to see if it's true. He said that the the the, the, the um, employment category with the highest rate of suicide in the United States is farmers. He said it actually is worldwide. So I was shocked because I, I've never seen farmers on any list like that. But and could you could you just address um, um, my comments? You know, you know, I, I will, Bob, but I have to take a break. <laughs> so if you don't okay. mind, I'm going to address exactly that when we get back uh, and with talking with Bob and Christine Wright on Healthy University.
So, you know, Bob, what you just hit on is what my new book's about. And in fact, the story you just told, unbelievably, <laughs> is is right. In, you know, when I wrote my book, I wrote it based on true life stories. I don't want to say I wrote it on fact because it's not necessarily fact. It's a book of fiction, but it's based on all these real things. You know, you can't predict what someone is feeling. You can't know what you can't get into someone's skin. All you can do is have empathy. And that's something that, boy, I think we're struggling with in this in this country, if not this world right now, is is being empathetic. Um, so when one of the interesting things is I haven't gotten to talk to too many schools. I end up talking to to older folks because I'm talking about bullying recovery. And one of the problems that I run into when trying to talk about bullying recovery is that the schools are afraid of what I'm saying. Uh, and what I mean is it's easy for them to bring in somebody who says bullying is bad. Here, you know, be a bystander, be a good person, da, da, da. But I'm coming in and saying bullying damages people like what you're saying, that the suicide, the, the, the second leading cause of death for young people is suicide. Um, and most of those suicides have been tied uh, to some form of abuse, bullying, depression, self-esteem, obviously self-esteem. But interestingly, as you also hit on, the, the highest level of suicides is in, is in middle age. You know, and I think that has to do with people not being satisfied or being under stress. So, like, when you say farmers, I always think, well, farmers are always under stress. Every year the crop could go south. You know, every year, you know, it could be a bad year. And if they have one bad year, the whole thing's over. So I, I always think about that. My father-in-law was a, a farmer. But I think for me, one of the disturbing th trends I, I feel like I see at schools is this idea that they're checking the box. They're basically saying, hey, we, we have an anti-bullying policy. We have an anti-bullying speaker come in every year. We're checking the box and saying we, we're doing it. But they're not paying attention to what's happening. So like at my old alma mater, four, four, four students at my high school in one year killed themselves. All, almost all of them over bullying and and abuse situations. And what what I know happens, what what I'm afraid is is this, what's happening in in society, in school society, that needs to be fixed. Is at the top is the administration of the school, and then at the top of them is the administration of the county schools, and then of course it goes further than that. And they're they're counting things by statistics. Oh, this school has a big bully problem. So a school wanting to report bullying. So imagine you're a principal and you're being evaluated based on how much bullying is going on in your school. And instead of the administration saying, well, we need to put more resources toward it at the school, they're going to fire the principal. You see what I mean? Yeah, I got it. And that's that's what I think the problem is, is that we're not addressing the true situation because, sure, maybe maybe we can prevent some bullying. But unfortunately, the latest studies have finally come out that say schools that have bullying problems actually have higher bullying percentages, which doesn't surprise me because they've created awareness and that awareness now is seen better than it was it is at other schools. But of course, that's not a good statistic for, again, the administration. So that's even more of a deterrent to not have them bring in uh, anti-bullying speakers or programs because... Right, Alan, I just want to cut in here and just say that, that, that unfortunately, that, that because the way things are set up, the paradigm is a blame paradigm, that, as you said, if the, the, the true if a principal shows the true statistics, he or she gets punished for it. And instead of saying, hey, listen, we're shining a light on this issue, let's correct it. But the, but if, if, if the systems are punitive in nature, well, like, um, then it becomes like a whack-a-mole thing. And then it actually becomes worse. And then the other people looking on, they say, hey, listen, I'm not going to step forward and say that this is going on. You know what I'm saying? Because, and then it gets pushed down further. And, and then, but we're at a crisis.
crisis point now, we've already reached the tipping point with the bullying because all you have to do is look at social media. And, and so it is literally out of control at every level, elementary school, middle school, and high school, and college because they've had all these uh, things with the hazing. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. There's an incredible, incredible video on YouTube called Evan. And I'm not going to ruin it for you or anyone in the audience that hasn't seen it. It's about school violence and how that can happen and about awareness. And and I think that's what we're invisible to. Like like I was saying sort of at the beginning, I'm, I'm on this kick now to talk about taking emotional attendance. You know, when we when we talk about people who are suffering, you, know, you can wear a mask only so far. But certainly in schools at work, you know, people become disconnected. People say, you know, maybe uh, mean or angry things or angry, uh, you know, grades drop for students. They, you know, they be, they're not talking. There's so many things if you were paying attention emotionally to that person. But teachers don't have time well, for that. Alan, as I listen to you, um, what occurs to me is that there's a huge aspect of denial in all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, in addition to the blame paradigm that Bob talks about, a perfect um, uh, juxtaposition is, is Andy's work. He's an EMT, and in in that system, it's allowed to come in and help someone. As a matter of fact, it's expected. If someone's in a particular crisis, they're going to call, and they're going to expect Andy to come and rescue them and help them and keep them calm and make them feel better and bring them to help. But when there's bullying going on in the school or in the job or in the family, the whole thing is to sweep it under the rug. Oh, nothing's going on. It was it was just a joke. No harm was done. You know, they'll grow out of it. They'll forget it. That's not true, as you said. It stays with people for a lifetime, and hopefully a long lifetime, but many children are killing themselves because of the emotional pain. Yeah, you said something very important, Alan, and you've been saying it for a long time. Empathy. Where yeah. is empathy in our society? Is our society, you know, um, attending to virtue? So much of our media, um, you know, there there are places where we see beautiful and lofty things, but a lot of the media is making fun, it's hurting, it's it's touting vices, it's it's showing people betraying each other bullying each other, being mean to each other, and we're filling our senses with that. So how can we be empathetic, as you say, which I believe is a big part of the answer. Um, And what Bob and I often talk about is social support. So where is it allowed and where are we taught how to seek social support, how to find someone, you know, the way you said your son cared for you. It, It was there. You could depend on him. You knew that he, he had your back when you were sick and when you needed him. That's the type of thing that we need to have more of. It's not a joke. If someone's hurting, hurting to the point that they take their life, there's nothing funny about that. No, and, and then, you know, I uh, again, I'd, I, I'd like to transition a little bit to my book, but, you know, that's that's what I decided to write about, and, and it was very difficult. I, I have to admit it was a, a difficult novel to write. And it's, I think, a difficult novel to read, but so important because it speaks to the fact that if we don't change these things, this is what's happening. And, you know, the op- the opposite of the pe- the kids taking their lives, of course, that I talk about is the kids bringing weapons to school. So another huge statistic that's come out is that kids who are bullied, particularly bullied relentlessly, do bring a weapon to school. At a very high rate. And that is something I know, of course, because I wrote about it in my own past uh, when I was feeling scared. But it's more than just scared. It's it's also the fact that, you know, one of my new favorite sayings, not favorite, but but things I say, is that hurt people hurt people. Um, so, you know, when innocence is lost, when when these things happen, you know, my son's here. He'll probably be happy to tell you about some of the things I've done when I get upset. You know, I 
I, yeah, tell us, Andy. We want to know. <laughs> but but I'm I'm no I'm no saint, and and I don't claim to be. And certainly before I I recovered, but I would say you know, and Andy, you can be honest. You know, I could I could get angry and and say some kind of mean things sometimes. Yeah, why do you think I moved out? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I no, that's real. I, I, I think you know our audience listening that 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 this is what we're we're really talking about the real deal here. It's not a smooth path, and it's not a smooth path for anyone, no matter how it looks from the outside. You know that every, you know it's, un- it's the same until you walk a mile in her high heels. <laughs> I think you know. Uh, that that's very painful. Why you know, like when I think of work walking in high heels, and that's what it's like when we experience. You know, like Alan, if you could imagine switching places with Andy, and Andy was the father, and then then you were the child, and 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 and, and he did the things that that to you that that caused them to move out. You know, I think that that's part of how empathy can be created when the person can really get it and say, oh, like, if that was me, oh, yeah, I wouldn't really, I really wouldn't appreciate it. Yeah. And, and I mean, I think Andy hopefully is half joking, but, uh, um, no, I mean, I, I, you know, we're, we're all fallible people and that's why going back to the beginning, you know, forgiveness and thank you and, and these things that we need to be able to say to each other and feel for each other are part of that empathetic solution is, you know, you can't just go, okay, I did this and, uh, we're just going to forget about it. Like I was brought up in a family of yellers, you know, I think we all have, you know, our family types and, and I think most of us end up marrying the opposite. At least I did. But, you know, my family was brought up yell, yell, yell. My, my parents used to play bridge at night and cr- my mother would be cursing at my dad at the top of her lungs. And my sister and I would would crawl into bed together and cry thinking they were getting divorced the next day, you know. And and then as we got older, we learned we learned. Oh, the, Alan, I have to interrupt you. <laughs> Why? What is that about? Did that level of contentiousness? What can you explain that? Because we see some of that behavior down here. Yeah. And, and, you know, we've been puzzled because, you know, we never saw some of these behaviors. What is that about? You're saying as a child, you you and your sister were crying when when they were just playing cards. So can you explain that? I, you know, I, I really think that we don't give enough, I, want, I guess, credence or credit to how we're brought up. I mean, you know, to believe that you're not going to be like your parents or that they didn't show you how to be, I think is untrue. Like Andy has a little bit of me in him uh, from a freak out standpoint. Sometimes things make him freak out just like things make me freak out. You know, sometimes the stress or whatever will get to it. It'll get to him and I see myself in, in what he's doing. And then my younger guy, I see a rebellious person just like I was. So what, what I think, you know, is really we're, we're a product of our upbringing. So again, you know, not not having seen what my mom and dad were like. I know my dad was in a very um, rough, uh, his, his mom was uh, bipolar and, and would lash out and ended up institutionalized. So I'm sure he dealt a lot with that. Um, and then my mother, her dad died when he, she was seven. And so her mother, um, I know, was a very hard woman. And so, you know, as I as I did my first book, trying to discover more about my own um, issues, I, I really do think that a lot of it is familial, whereas, you know, my wife is an interesting case. Like, I still think to this day, you know, 25 years later in marriage, she still struggles to figure out my family life, how we can all yell at each other um, and have argument. We are argumentative people. And then, you know, kiss and hug at the end and say goodbye. Whereas her family, if they get mad at each other, they're they're silent for three months and then it's like it never happened. That's because mom had three sisters. (laughs) I don't know if that's it. But but I think that's a product of of her upbringing was that you weren't, uh, if if you were upset, you weren't to do anything about it and you just let it cool off and then pretended it didn't happen. And I think for me, I'm like, I can't stand that. 
I've got to get a conclusion, you know, whether it's an I'm sorry or you hurt me or whatever we got to do to close the loop. You know, it's the old idea of not going to bed angry, right? I, I hate that. I, I, that's like my pet peeve. And so we have fun. Well, Alan, I, I may be uh, opening a can of worms here, <laughs> but um, one of the, um, this is like a slight tangent, but because you brought up the, the issue, you, you, what you actually mentioned, that your mother used to um, use profanity uh, when, when she was playing uh, cards with your father, um, one of the things that Christine and I have noticed, and, I, and I'm sure our listeners have noticed the same thing, there, there, you know, there are aspects of our society and culture that where it's, it's literally evolving, where, you know, there was a standard, or at least a pretense of a standard, and now um, there's not. And so here's what I'm talking about specifically. We have noticed that in the past six months or so, that we are getting emails with subject titles from various people, and they're using curse words Mm. in either the the, the subject line of the email or they are, or in the body of the email, and, or in their video attachment or whatever. And so, you know, Christine and I, you know, at first, when we first saw this, um, then now it's like it's become a deluge, like it's a fad or something. So, um, you know, when we get a subject line and has profanity in it, doesn't matter what, what it is, is that we just delete it. Yeah. Um, you know, that's us. So I imagine some people are opening it, uh, I guess, because they, they wouldn't be sending them out. But, the, you know, this is, seems to be part of everything. It's like this, this shock value. Everything has to be like giving people electric shock because, you know, attention pans, spans are so short. And, you know, it's like when someone, when I said, um, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, I read a study where they said the average person has the attention span of a goldfish, which was eight seconds. They said, oh, no, it's not that long. It's down to three seconds. A goldfish has a long attention span compared to an average person. So could, are, you, are you seeing the same thing? And, 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 and Andy, are you seeing the same thing? Do you, do you, do you, are you getting emails? you see things coming in on your phone where it's using a lot of curse words, profanity, and um, other inappropriate stuff coming in? Now, I, I'm 23 years old, and I live with three other 23 year olds so most of what I see either starts or ends with profanity Um, but from a professional standpoint uh, like as in work emails things like that uh, not so much I mean my workplace is a lot more lax so things can things that come through, um, they're not gonna look like uh, what I used to get when I was working nine to five computer job. But now in the ER, some of the emails I get from my preceptors or from my managers are a little bit less. Uh, I guess they're more casual, but um, nothing nothing to the extreme you know, that I'm you, receiving. It, it's interesting, and, and you know, I, you know, certainly. I hear how how Andy and, and my other son talk, and you know, I also you can watch TV or, or read or anything, and you know, TV today what's acceptable on most of the non-major stations, I would say, I haven't seen it as much on the major stations, is was R-rated when I I was a kid. I mean, even even. NC-17 slash X, like I remember, you know, Dawn of the Dead being rated X before there was NC-17 for violence that's in on weekly on Walking Dead, right? You know, and then I I, I feel like, you know, it's part of getting older. As we get older, we, we tend to be a little more conservative in our speech and how we say things. And, and I... I think, you know, Andy, when I when I hear you and your friends talk, I think you're a little more free, like, language isn't really an effector. It's like, just, it, it's used as punctuation and not really, like, you don't mean to, to use it to, to get people upset. You, you just use it. It's just part of life. The way we speak and talk with it, in fact, is more of, this is someone I can be honest with and give my full-fledged raw opinion and that's kind of how I talk with my roommates and my friends and so I can see where profanity might be used there but in terms of 
other people that I might not be comfortable with, don't trust. I'm not going to be profane or use, you know, profane things I'm putting a face on until I can trust someone. Right. So when in terms of what you're talking about where me and my brother talk and yeah. we use certain language or uh, talk in a certain way or when me and my friends talk, those are the people I'm most comfortable with, can trust, and that's just how my generation at the least speaks to one another. But, we, but isn't it a bit ageist? Like, you, you, you know that your mom and I, like, aren't really crazy about it. So you probably temper it a little bit, although you feel comfortable with us, so I know that it comes out. But don't you feel like it's it's a little bit generational? And, I mean, I'll, I'll give an example from my generation. I know, I know you, Bob and Christine are a little older than me, but, you know, Eddie Murphy was really big when I was a teen. And he put out a comedy album, and we used to play that incessantly. Thought it was the funniest thing ever. And then I heard, like, part of it the, uh, not long ago, and it was so full of profanity. And I forgot all about the fact of how profane it was. And I, I really think that we just get more conservative. Like, we realize, hey, you know, we don't want society to be using all this profanity as we get older. Um, so I think that's it's almost like... A, uh, age restricted. I, I I certainly think you're right, Bob, that, you know, years and years and years ago, but I, I also think that, that kids, you know, in their teens, they've been using profanity a long time. You know, there's, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of, you know, people who were, were not using it particularly in the teen years to, to other teenagers. I mean, I don't think they talk to their teachers. Alan, you know, you, I, I just wanted to say, uh, that that you know, I agree with part of what you're saying, and then the other aspect is that um, this is, a, I guess, a values issue because I remember I used to take groups of people camping up to Connecticut, and this was in the 19 early 1980s where I had an incident where I, I we always used to bring people that we knew, and so. Uh, friends of a friend brought people that I didn't know and then I remember getting up early on the Sunday morning and this guy he was had on the end we were on this lake so the sound traveled like so far you just couldn't believe because we were outdoors in the wilderness and he had on his portable TV this is in the early 80s and he had on Eddie Murphy Raw right. Eddie Murphy Raw and you know we had children and there were other people there you know young children and he's got this thing blasting like at 6.30 in the morning so I remember coming out of the cabin and I was like oh my god what is this racket and I said oh my god listen to what he's playing I can't believe it so um in 1982 uh alan i was a little younger than i am in 2017 so i I had those values back then so my point is it's not just uh age uh related so 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 it it, it has to do with uh perception um alan i just wanted to make this comment on the subject I think there are generational differences, um, but it's situational. There's so many factors, and I think it comes down to intention. For example, I'm sure that when Andy is talking to his friends and they're using these words, it's not necessarily a, a quarrel or a contention that um, things change over time, and what was once used to be offensive or to attack, it's just now commonplace jargon and I think the thing is if someone's personal sensibility it doesn't suit them then you want to respect that you know I remember as a child in school we would talk one way to our friends but when an adult came we spoke a different way so it's different in different settings and I think it's Um, you know you're also onto something that that I think about a lot which is that it's societal and what I mean by societal I don't necessarily mean you know in the Midwest they do this I work with a lot of military people and different branches of the military and I will tell you that depending on the branch and I won't mention the branch by name but there, there are, you know, people talk about the Air Force being the smartest people in the, in the military, the Navy being the second. So as you go down that food chain, the people, and I'm talking about older adults in their 60s, 50s, 60s, cuss up a storm. 
And that's part of what the culture of that military experience taught them. Um, because, you know, when they're in a battlefield situation or when they're, you know, in a high stress, I think I think we've gone really full circle on the use of, of language and talk in this discussion, which I love, um, which is why people may talk the way they talk. You know, why why did my parent why did it upset me so much to hear my parents when I was a young kid? But now when they fight, I don't think twice about it. Right. You know, it's just now I know it's just their nature. Um, and, and I know with my sons, it's their nature and, and I know with army people, it's their nature. And much like I talk about how I've become a chameleon in my life, I'll fall right into their nature just so that they accept me. <laughs> so great, Alan, I'm just, I'm, uh, looking at the, the, uh, the clock and yep. I'm wondering, um, since you have indicated that, that that, you know, in 2016, you really want to focus on recovery, healing, and solutions. And uh, in 2017. Yeah, and the new year, too. And in 2017, <laughs> too. And in 2018 and 19 and 20. Right. <laughs> so, I stand corrected. So, my question is, do we have time for me to demonstrate for our listeners? Uh, I, I actually have come up with a custom open focus exercise, which... It could be helpful for dissolving traumatic bullying uh, memories. Let's so do it. Yeah, let's do, do it. Do you want to go to that, or should that actually be in a separate podcast? Oh, we can do a part two. You want to do a part two? I'd love to do that. And then we could spend all our time on that. Um, because, I mean, I certainly want to want to talk about just my book, and, and maybe that's a good segue to the part two, is how we how we do get to that point of what you're doing and what I'm doing um, to try to, to solve this, to try to recover people, because that's what it's really and about. Christine has a fantastic breathing exercise that, that, that every time she performs it in front of others, I am just amazed at the benefit. And when I later, when I talk to people, oh, say, yeah. you know, Christine did this uh, breathing exercise, did you find it helpful? And you know, it could be months later, and they say, "Oh yeah, I'm still doing it." Yeah, the breath. The breath is everything. Everything starts with the breath, and the breath is everything. I mean, I, I will tell you that you know, someone who studies mindfulness, that that's what it's all. You go to yoga, and you have to breathe right. You meditate, and you have to breathe right. You walk, and you learn to breathe right. And you sit calmly, and you practice belly breathing. Everything is the breath. Everything goes right, back so to the Alan, breath. So, Alan, let's take your your suggestion. Let's make this a two part podcast. And yep. So, why don't you wrap up part one with with your uh, information about your book? Well, so yeah, thank you. And and so my my book has just been released. In fact, today, so I've got three versions out. I've got the uh, first edition, which costs a little more, of course, but it's the first edition. I've got the second edition, which is a little less and can be found on Amazon and all the other sites. And then I've got a Kindle version, and hopefully I'll have an audio version really soon. But it's a book called Crossing the Line, uh, A Cautionary Bullying Tale. And what I wanted to do this time, so my first one was a memoir. Um, I really wanted to start the conversation, and it really is a start of a conversation about bullying recovery. And I'm starting with what I would call a bang. And yes, that's a little bit of a... A play on words. Um, crossing the line is the line that are the two extremes that bullying victims go to when they feel they have nowhere else to go. And those two places we brought them up here um, is suicide and school violence with a weapon. And so my book is about how that comes to be, how people take other people to that level and what's going on behind the scenes that you're not seeing, because I think one of the most important things we're going to have to understand, and we've touched on it a lot, whether it's my parents cussing and all this, or other people's lives at home, or the way society is, you know, we're a product of what's happening to us around us at, at many times in our lives. And many times, particularly in youth, we don't have enough knowledge to know what to do. And I think that's why you see what you see. But extreme trauma, which, of course, bullying fits into, um, can can do incredibly adverse things to your psyche, to your physiology, to your mental health. 
And this is now proven. I mean, what I started in 2007 that no one was talking about, you know, about the long term damage that bullying does is now proven true. And so now we have to deal with the fact that we know that, you know, it's it's I always talk about the four squares of learning. Right. You don't know what you don't know. Then you you find out about what you didn't know. Then you learn what you didn't know. And then you become an expert at what you didn't know. And then you start again. That's a cycle of learning, right? So we're just sort of getting to know what we didn't know. You know, we thought kids were kids were just kids and they grow out of it. Doesn't happen. We know that now. Not only doesn't it happen, but we're seeing much more drastic measures happening. And so my book, Crossing the Line, starts by opening up the conversation about how does this happen? How does someone come to take their own life or decide to bring a weapon to school or commit, you know, commit a, a heinous school killing? Um, and, and I hope I confronted it with truth, with honesty. As I said, I, I based it all on factual stories, um, but it all takes place in one small town that, of course, doesn't see it all around them. And so I'm hoping it's an eye opener book and then we can start the conversation on stopping it from happening because until people. Well, Alan, I just wanted to to, to say that recently I know I sent you a story for your paper lead, which was a real life example. I think it was the uh, Dairy Queen manager who was 21 who had uh, bullied uh, the employee who was 17 incessantly. And, you know, from, at least from the news reports, it, it was pretty, um, uh, a pretty sad situation, very tragic. But the, 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 uh, in that particular case, that's a real case. It was a small town. I believe the population was less than 3,000 people. And um, the, the kid killed himself. And in this case, uh, she's being brought up on charges of yeah. voluntary manslaughter, so, which is actually very rare. So yep. the thing is, is that... That, um, you know, again, talking about solutions that, you know, that, 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 you know, what, what can be done? Of course, you know, we don't want people killing themselves because they've been bullied. That, that's just what goes without saying. And so hopefully uh, during our next show, we can really lay out the solutions because, again, you know, we've done uh, a lot of analysis here, which mm-hmm. is excellent. Uh, you know, to get to the healing, people really need workable solutions, and and I'm looking forward to doing that. Yeah, and I think show. I think that would be great because that's that's really the next step in in I think what we're both doing is that there are solutions, and and I'm going my next challenging writing assignment is to write the bullying recovery primer that I would like to have schools use in learning to one detect and two how to handle, mainly through empathetic means, uh, the children that they're dealing with, both the bullies and the bullying survivors. It's not one-sided. And I think that that would be great. So let's let's do that. I, I love talking to you guys. I can't believe an hour has gone by. And, and I got to tell know, you... It's incredible. Well, I um, will look forward to that book, but I'm sure right now that our listeners will enjoy crossing the line. Yeah. Alan, I would like to um, just um, close with what we've done in the past with each of us just taking a brief moment to share um, our final thoughts with the audience. Great. Um, I'll start, and then Andy can go after me, and we, we'll go to you guys. Um, okay, very good. What, what I, I like really, that. what I really enjoyed about this conversation was, you know, it was triggered about the words we use, and and I know when we started that was sort of not our original intent, but it was an amazing conversation about how we approach others and how we show ourselves to others and things that we do. And I think that's such an amazingly important item that so many of us forget that our words do affect people. It's not just action. You know, I always say, you know, back up your words with action. But if you've used the words, you know, and they're damaging, you're going to you're going to have a hard time taking them back. So I, I love that we've really hit on that subject. 
Um, my favorite subject that we hit on, which I think is one of the most important, is empathy. And like uh, Christine said earlier, where is the empathy? I think in today's society where everything that we create and invent is to make our lives easier, um, a lot of people also put empath empathy in the same category. It, it's easier to not empathize with someone who's in pain or suffering. It's easier to ignore that. Mm -hmm. And that's where the empathy is. The empathy is, it's, it's not easy to empathize. And that's what people, you know, they, they know that mm -hmm. we know that, but it's something that needs to be done in order for everyone to, you know, live on this earth peacefully together and happy without empathy. We, we can't, you know, we can't be there for each other. And people, we, we don't live alone. We are, we group together, we make colonies, and that's how people are happy. People aren't happy when they're alone, down, and by themselves. We need to be there for someone who's down. You know, you empathize with them, but you got to be there for them first. That's the first thing to do. And if there's anything to take away from what I just said, it's, it's be there for the people that need you. That is so beautiful, Andy. I, um, I'm going to use what you said with what I'd like to share. Alan, something you said reminded me of what our colleague um, Reggie Mara talks about. He says story matters. The mm -hmm. same way your family of origin and your wife's family of origin, um, you both had different experiences. So all of us, we think that what happens in our household or in our life is global. It's not. It's just ours. So... As we have the ability to transcend and transform our stories, we will be happier for that when we can forgive what didn't work, when we can be grateful for what did work, when we can be honest and share, when we can be empathetic, when we can really feel, when we can grieve what was lost and what didn't go right, when we can move beyond our story, when we're not reactive and trying to hurt ourselves or do harm to someone else, that's when we can truly be who we were meant to be. That's when we can live in awareness and go out in the world with good intention, which I think is, is what we were designed for. Mm -hmm. um, we're social creatures. We want to be with each other. We want to connect. So we need to find a way to move beyond our hurts so that we can really live a joyful life. Beautiful. It really is. In, in closing, I'd like to mention that we have an upcoming podcast with uh, Dr. Maria Nemeth, who we did a podcast with her uh, last year, and we'll be doing a podcast with her coming up. And when Christine and I saw her in Atlanta, one of the things that she said, which I found most beautiful, which I believe our audiences could benefit from, she asked a core question, and so that's what I want to leave our audience with, this core question. Would it be okay if life got easier to, to really ask yourself that question in a self-reflective way with honesty and authenticity and intimacy with yourself and the various parts of yourself because many people don't seem to realize that we have these various parts and they often can be in conflict with us and that can underlie self-sabotage. So, audience, would it be okay if life got easier and if the answer is no for you, well, then, you know, because some people believe that the only thing that's valuable is if it's hard. And so um, I'm, what, what I'm suggesting by offering that question is a paradigm shift that, that imagine that, that if life got easier, well, I'll let you finish the sentence. I think this was a beautiful conversation, and um, yeah, I, re I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to part two. We'll just schedule that real soon, so we don't leave the audience hanging. Um, but uh, really, a wonderful conversation about you know what we have to fa what we have to face for our future, what we have to look toward the future and hope. You know, we can we can get people to uh, to understand and accept, which is that. We are social, 
And in such, we are affected socially by what happens around us, good and bad. And I think that that's something we all have to have better awareness of. So thank you guys. Thanks, Bob and Christine and uh, Andy. <laughs> you can be on the show anytime, bud. Um, yes, th- thank you too, um, Alan and Andy. Thank you for joining us. We hope to have you uh, with us more often. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, thank you Alan and Andy, uh, father and son team. Ama- amazing. Audience, safe and be well. Be right. well. Thank you for listening to Healthy University, brought to you by Bullying Recovery, LLC. This podcast does not replace the need for medical advice, professional diagnosis, opinion, treatment, or services to you or any other individual. The information provided here or through linkages to other sites is not a substitute for medical or professional care, and you should not use the information in place of a visit, call, consultation, or the advice of your physician or other health care provider. Join us next time for more Healthy University.